Good evening. Good evening. Good evening to you too. My name is Bob Fishback. I'm president of the Chatter Marconi Maritime Center. I'm pleased to welcome, welcome you to part two of our collaboration with the Atwood Museum, Women at Sea, Then and Now. A thank you to Kevin Wright and Christina Koskoris of the Atwood for working with our team of Liz McCart, <laughs> hiding in the corner, Ron Ferris, who's hiding in the back room, John Kassian in the back of the room, and Ed Moxon, who isn't here tonight, uh, to host and record these companion talks. On Tuesday evening, we learned from Barbara Semple that what life was like for captains' wives in the 1800s accompanying their husbands around the world on sailing ships. Tonight, we'll learn from Sarah Kazamayas and Samantha Coles that it's not your great grandmother's maritime industry anymore, baby. <laughs> the China trade that Barbara spoke of has evolved from hefty, slow wooden sailing vessels to giant steel ships stacked high with metal boxes full of cargoes. And women's roles have evolved as well. Now, before we start, I have a few logistics items for those here in the Education Center. The bathrooms are in the rear hallway through that arched doorway that I'm pointing at in the rear. <clears throat> uh, there's drinking water available in the kitchen in cans if you'd like it. Also back through that uh, arch doorway. Uh, masks, uh, COVID is a wonderful thing. Masks are optional. Uh, if you feel uncomfortable at all, we have the ventilation on in the place. Uh, but if you feel uncomfortable at all, please feel free to wear a mask, especially if you don't trust the person you came with. And most important, most importantly, please silence your cell phones. And I'm going to do that myself because I did not do that. <clears throat> Following their presentation and time permitting, our speakers will answer a few questions from the audience. Here in the room, you'll simply raise your hand um, and uh, Sarah will, will call on you. Um, in the home audience, uh, please enter your questions at any time uh, on your Zoom screen by clicking Q&A at the bottom of the screen and typing in your question. Liz McCart will screen the questions for duplications and relay them to our speakers at the appropriate time. Our first speaker tonight is Sarah Kazamias. Kazamias, I'll get it right yet. All right, well, I'm just, just wandering around the world here. <clears throat> She's a graduate of Massachusetts Maritime Academy in Buzzards Bay and currently the Academy's commercial shipping coordinator. After earning her deck license in 2010, Sarah sailed with the Military Sea Lift Command for seven years, earning her used Coast Guard Chief Mate Unlimited license. She worked on multiple vessel platforms to include tankers, cargo, tug and barge, and salvage ships in all parts of the world, but mainly in the Middle East. She worked with a variety of cargo including ammunition, fuel, dry and reefer stores, supporting the US Navy through underway and vertical replenishments at sea. Following her sailing career, she earned her MBA at the University of New Hampshire. She began her career at Mass Maritime, teaching leadership, discipline, and operational effectiveness, went on to the career and professional services team as the Academy's outreach coordinator, and now aids US Coast Guard licensed track students in their at sea internships and sailing careers. Sarah is joined tonight by senior cadet Sam Coles, who will graduate next June with a Bachelor of Science in Marine Transportation. Ms. Coles is enrolled in the leadership program at the Academy and mentors students aboard the Mass Maritimes training ship Kennedy. She completed her seagoing internship with Kirby Offshore and works for Highline Cruise as a deckhand. It is my pleasure to introduce Sarah and Sam. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Liz. Thank you to the uh, Chatham Marconi Maritime Center for hosting Mass Maritime today. Um, I have a, uh, a slideshow because I think showing some of my um, personal at home videos and uh, photos would be the best way to share my at sea stories. So um, I'm going to scroll through those. Uh, and so thank you again. And uh, just to reiterate some of that, that bio, yes, Sam and I are both 
uh, a part of the maritime history at Mass Maritime. I wanted to start off the presentation by uh, kind of describing Mass Maritime and what uh, the history is behind the academy and kind of can't really appreciate uh, the current now and the, the students enrolled there and the females that are enrolled there without really knowing the past of the academy a little bit. So I do wanna show you um, some of that history. I will then go on to talk about my personal uh, stories at sea. I'm then gonna talk a little bit about my role now at the academy and then I'm gonna pass it on to Sam who's gonna talk about sort of the current on the boots uh, interaction she has at the academy. Okay, so uh, the history of Mass Maritime, again, just because there's just a couple important dates that I wanna highlight. Um, in 1891, uh, what we now know as Massachusetts Maritime Academy was actually named uh, the Massachusetts Nautical Training School. Uh, and it was established in Boston with a class of 40 men in the first class. Um, it came down by a congressional order to, to establish a, a nautical school, a maritime school in which uh, the Commonwealth could produce maritime uh, officers that would then be able to participate in ocean going trade. It was a two year curriculum at the time. Um, the men that were involved were uh, in the uh, realms of engineering and navigation, seamanship and electrical engineering. Uh, during the, the school's history, the academy was always tied to different training vessels. That was sort of the hands-on portion that cadets had at the time. They would go to sea uh, and learn sort of the semesters at sea and learn on the job, the, the sailing trade. Uh, while we were established in Boston, the, the cadets at the time were part of a couple very cool tidbits I just wanted to share. Uh, they were part of the great molasses spill in Boston's North End uh, at that time there was a, a molasses factory that ended up um, erupting and there was molasses all over the port and our cadets because of proximity of where they uh, were uh, for the nautical training school uh, were the first responders at the time so they did help save lives um, even though there were a few that perished uh, we also had uh, over 300 mass Mar well at the time massachusetts nautical training school alumni that served in world war one uh, we had a gentleman by the name of Captain Emery Rice, uh, the class of 1897, who was the captain of the steamship Magnolia, who uh, was the captain that made the command of fire uh, upon a German U-boat, smashing a periscope and causing it to disappear. This marked America's first hit on a German sub and considered a hero even today. Um, so in 1942, uh, we're skipping a little bit ahead after those facts, the Massachusetts Nautical Training School moved to Hyannis uh, and was renamed to the Massachusetts Maritime Academy. Uh, the reason it moved was because Hyannis provided more uh, open space for the regiment of cadets and for the growing uh, number of students. It then at that point uh, turned from a two-year curriculum to a three-year bachelor program. In 1949, MMA, uh, Massachusetts Maritime Academy, I'll refer to it as MMA, relocated to Taylor's Point. You can see a picture here in the uh, lower left-hand corner. If anyone has been to the current Massachusetts Maritime campus, it no longer looks like this. Uh, <laughs> it has added many more modern day buildings, libraries, uh, simulators, uh, and, and classroom and dorms. In 1977, though, this again is where the history um, takes a turning point, something I wanted to highlight, was the first female cadets reported to orientation at Mass Maritime uh, as the class of 1981. This was nearly 100 years after the establishment of the Nautical Maritime School, now known as Mass Maritime. So in uh, 1972, uh, that is when the Maritime Administration, our uh, federal governing agency, wrote a general order, number 87, that uh, allowed all genders to attend the Maritime Academies. That's, what the switch, that's when the switch occurred, and that's when the Academy started to um, proceed to allow women on the campus. And so 1977, we had five brave young women that are pictured here in the lower left that broke the barriers of uh, uh, that, that the academy had set um, through the barriers of all the males at um, MMA. Since then, hundreds of women have come through the academy, uh, but what is very neat about these five women are they are still actively involved at the academy. One of them is actually on our board of trustees, um, but they all are uh, involved in mentorship of the women that are currently uh, enrolled at the academy and beyond. Okay, so what does MMA look like today? 
uh, very, very different than some of those earlier slides with those pictures. Um, we're fortunate to say that we have around 14% enrollment of uh, females in the total undergraduate uh, uh, enrollment, uh, which is a great number. You know, it's always something we strive to get more of uh, as we move forward and we progress in our um, capacities and we spread the word of the special place that the maritime industry holds uh, and what uh, the capabilities are. But this photo just represents some of the, the highlights that have even happened in the last couple of years. Um, in the upper right hand corner we have a picture of a uh, female student uh, who is the leader of all of the regiment of cadets. So she is the uh, top female student leader. She oversees her peers. She oversees the underclassmen. She is in charge of nearly 1,300 enrolled students. Um, she is the regimental commander and she has another female student that is her um, um, right-hand woman, who is the executive office officer, and this is the first time in history we've had two women at the top tier of leadership at the academy in the student role. But you can also see that we have uh, incorporated, you know, women in all aspects of the academy. We have uh, we have sports teams that are all women. We have, um, you know, uh, clubs, and we have. Uh, you know, activities that involve and mentor uh, women uh, going to sea. And even though, and even uh, other majors that are not seagoing at the academy that we have, um, we're all inclusive. But we're growing in number, and it's something that we're proud to say. And here is just that statistic of the current uh, male to female ratio at uh, Massachusetts Maritime Academy. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that and where we've come. We've come so far uh, with women in, in leadership, women at the academy, uh, and women in the maritime sector. Uh, what I want to focus on next then is my personal story. Uh, it will kind of come full circle at the end of these slides, but I want to talk a little bit about what I did when I graduated uh, in 2010. So I was enrolled as a student from 2006 to 2010 as an undergrad. Uh, again, I majored in marine transportation. So upon my graduation, I received a United States Coast Guard third mate unlimited tonnage license, meaning I could sail on a vessel of any size of, in any ocean, any part of the world. So uh, the industry was available to me in any way that I wanted to. And I, I knew uh, from the beginning that I wanted to work for Military Sea Lift Command, which is a, a, a a large sector of the Maritime Academy, but it's a little bit different than maybe the, the merchant ships you hear about too that are kind of point A to point B delivering cargo. Military Sealift Command does a little bit more than that. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what MSC is, and I'll refer to it as MSC, uh, Military Sealift Command, and what they're about. Um, Backtracking just a little bit, the reason I joined Mass Maritime as a student, you know, freshman year 2006, is I know that I wanted to do something in the Coast Guard sector. I, I wanted a profession that kept me out of the office. I wanted something that was adventurous. Um, I knew that I wasn't, I didn't really want to sit around, at least in my early 20s. I wanted to see the world. And so uh, I grew up in Burlington, Vermont, which is not the most... Um, seagoing location. I, I don't have any family that are seafarers. Um, so I, I learned about Mass Maritime being that it was fairly close to uh, my hometown. Uh, and I enrolled and since then, I, you know, haven't regretted a single day. So upon graduation, I worked for MSC. Uh, and a little bit about MSC too, there's a great picture here of all of the ships that they actually own. Um, MSC is a branch of the Department of Defense. I worked as a federal employee for them, so I um, uh, was on board and uh, really immersed in sort of the military aspect of shipping. Uh, even though I was a civilian, I had to follow a lot of the Navy rules still. Um, so I was still in uniform like I was as a cadet. Um, you know, a lot of the uh, sort of etiquette on the bridge was very similar to what we learned in the regiment of cadets. So it was a really great transition. But uh, MSC owns all of these vessels here. The ones that I particularly worked on were the ones that are actually in dark blue. It's kind of hard to see on here. Um, those are the vessels that uh, federal civilians will man. And so they have a sort of a wide fleet of different operational vessels, but just as a couple of facts about MSC that I thought were very interesting, uh, during World War II, four separate government agencies controlled sea transportation. In 1949, the Military Sea Transportation Service became the single managing agency for the Department of Defense Ocean's transport needs. The command assumed responsibility for providing sea lift and ocean transportation for all military services as well as for other government agencies. 
Only nine months after its creation, the MSTS responded to the challenges of the Korean War. On July 6, 1950, only 11 days after the initial invasion of South Korea by North Korean troops, the MSTS tr uh, transported the 24th Infantry Division and its equipment from Japan to Pusan, South Korea for duty. During the Vietnam War, MSTS was renamed M Military Sealift Command. Between 1965 and 1969, MSC transported nearly 54 million tons of combat equipment and supplies to nearly 8 million tons uh, and supplies and nearly 8 million tons of fuel to Vietnam. MSC ships also transported troops to Vietnam. Uh, this marked the last era where troops were transported by vessel and not by air. Through the 1970s and 1980s, MSC provided the Department of Defense with ocean transportation in support of the U.S. deterrent efforts during the Cold War. During the Persian Gulf Wars, Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm, MSC distinguished itself as the largest source of defense transportation of any nation involved. MSC ships delivered more than 12 million tons of wheeled and tracked vehicles, helicopters, ammunition, dry cargo, fuel, and other supplies and equipments during the war. At the height of the war, MSC managed more than 230 government-owned and chartered ships. On September 11, 2001, MSC uh, ships played a vital role in continuing uh, for contingency operations around the world, as of January 2013, MSC ships delivered more than 25.7 billion gallons of fuel and moved 126.2 million square feet of combat equipment and supplies to U.S. and coalition forces engaged in operations supporting Iraq and Afghanistan. Okay, and here are some of my actual personal, some of my personal uh, photos and, and what I was a part of. So to really sum that up in what MSC is all about, um, MSC is a uh, supplier for the U.S. Navy and allied nations around the world. It is a uh, federal government arm that um, helps aid the Navy vessels uh, so that they can stay on station for their missions, their operational missions. MSC vessels go in and out of port, um, onloading all the, f the fuel and cargo and ammunition that our military needs, and then we deliver it in what we call an underway replenishment. And that's what this picture shows here in the upper left-hand corner. That is an MSC ship. The Gray Hall ship is an MSC vessel. Um, it is underway at around um, 12 knots, and you are underway and you're about 150 feet apart from another vessel. And that is how replenishment happens for MSC. It is not a uh, point A to point B cargo drop-off. It is a drop-off at sea. And in this case, this, this vessel, it's an oiler, it's a fleet oiler, is uh, transporting fuel to a Coast Guard cutter so that they don't have to go into port and onload fuel. They can get it at sea and maintain their mission and do not have to worry about those logistics. We do it for them. Um, but here are a couple of the different platforms I've been on. You actually can also underway replenish uh, on both sides of the vessel. So I have been a part of um, uh, either two underway replenishments and um, helicopters moving at the same time. Again, I have pictures for those. And I've also had a lineup of ships behind, you know, aft of our vessel waiting for replenishment for a, a full day underway replenishment evolution. Uh, we, I, I went on multiple deployments with the, air, uh, with the uh, carrier strike groups. And so the picture on the bottom right is uh, one of the aircraft carriers that uh, we serviced. More into that in a moment. Uh, when I was on board, I served on multiple different types of ships. I started off as third mate. Uh, I then moved into a second mate position and then ultimately as, as a uh, chief mate. And in all those sectors, I uh, had varying responsibilities that started off in bridge watch standing. Um, I moved then to cargo and had to manage the logistics of uh, moving ammunition, you know, things that are highly volatile, highly dangerous. Um, that ranged from missiles to bombs to uh, what we called Cat 1 material, which are uh, things that really don't take much of a button to explode, like grenades. Um, and we, we carried millions of tons of ammunition for our U.S. Navy and allied nations. Um, and then as chief mate, I was involved in all aspects, whether it was the bridge operations and overseeing some of the um, third mates and the second mate below me and the entire deck crew of about 30, and uh, also in charge of the safe navigation of the vessel and the uh, efficient cargo movements needed for everyday operations. Okay, so I wanted to show you a video, actually. 
and I have it right here. of an underway replenishment. I think it does a little bit more justice than uh, a photo. Um, but here is the USS uh, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, an aircraft carrier. Uh, this is just a YouTube video, it's not my personal one. I do have a couple of those coming up. Um, but it, it showed a great clip of what uh, underway replenishment looks like at sea and how dangerous it can be. Uh, there are many multiple layers of visibility when it comes to deck officers on board. There's more than you would see on a merchant vessel. And the reason is, is because of the, the nature of the work. I mean, you're 150 feet apart from another vessel underway moving highly volatile cargo, um, any wrong move, any wrong steering, even just a couple degrees could cause um, casualty. So there are many eyes and ears on every uh, operation when it comes to alongside maneuvering. So the middle ship here is a, a tanker again. Uh, you can see that they're uh, delivering in the very upper corner there uh, cargo via wire. It's called a high line. Um, and, this, and that underway replenishment station, which is uh, pictured here too, uh, is a workings of hydraulics and different machinery to uh, make sure that that line does not go slack because that would obviously impair uh, the movement of cargo across. Um, and it moves the, the goods and commodities that the, the vessel has requested. Uh, and then the other hoses that you saw were for fuel transfer. So in a lot of cases, um, we would, if we were underway replenishing, say, an aircraft carrier, which was our biggest customer in a way, um, we would, in a day, we would move over 3,000 pallets of cargo. We would deliver over, you know, hundreds of thousands of uh, gallons of jet fuel for their aircraft. And um, this would take us usually about eight hours on station. This is a picture of the vertical replenishment, um, a little bit different than underway replenishment, where underway replenishment is by wire alongside vertical replenishment is by helicopter. And so at the same time, while um, underway replenishing, uh, in most cases, vertical replenishment was also going on. And in this case, uh, naval, uh, naval pilots uh, would be flying these helicopters. They'd be on board the MSC vessel with us, and they would be in charge of maneuvering off of our flight deck and moving cargo underneath. A, there's a pole that uh, then captures the cargo, and they move it flight deck to flight deck. So these pilots I give many kudos to because they're not landing on a stationary platform or at an airport. They're moving on a vessel that is going 12 knots. Everything is relative. There is nothing that is stationary. Um, they put their lives at risk every day, but we worked closely with them as deck officers. I was actually, uh, as a chief mate, in charge of the tower. So just like a tower you picture uh, at a... Uh, an airport where you have to deal with the logistics of who's flying and when they can land and uh, how they can land and what cargo they need to pick up, that was a chief mate duty. Okay, so I do actually have a, a picture of a modern day bridge of one of the ships I worked on. It was the USNS uh, Sacagawea. Uh, but before that, I wanted to just always, everyone's always interested what like living quarters look like and you know a lounge looks like in modern day ships. Um, as an officer, you do get your own living quarters. So that's on the upper uh, left hand corner there. Uh, it is spacious, you do get your own head. Um, and then the, uh, the lounge is on the right where a lot of the officers would hang out. Um, we would have conferences in there and meetings. and. You can connect uh, to family members, in some cases, uh, on the computer there. So this is my actual home video of uh, my time on Sacagawea in 2011. Uh, and this just shows the modern day bridge. Uh, this was a couple of days before we left for uh, deployment to the Middle East. Uh, we were in Earl, New Jersey. If anyone's ever been to New York City uh, and you go down to the Statue of Liberty, uh, you can see this pier that jets out from uh, New Jersey. It's called an ammunition pier and an ammunition depot. And it's one of the main hubs on the East Coast where MSC vessels will onload and offload ammunition. The pier itself, you can't tell in this video, uh, is several miles long out into the Sandy Hook um, area in the bay, and the reason for that is because uh, over past history and moving ammunition, uh, there have been explosions in the past, luckily nothing uh, recent or anything, but uh, they've learned from those mistakes, and the reason the pier is that long is that should there be an accident, they would want to prevent as many civilian casualties um, on the shore. So the pier is several miles long. 
But this just shows the modern day bridge and some of the equipment that we worked with. Um, here you can see like watertight door access that you can control it all from the bridge. You could even control the main engines. That's what that uh, computer screen shows. Uh, obviously not without permission with the engineers, but you could see all the live um, stats, the RPMs. You could see what um, engines were online, what generators were online. You, uh, this was the chart table and one of the logging tables. A lot of the logging now is not done by paper and pen. It's done by electronics. So that was where you would, that's your log book is the computer screen. You would have repeaters for your GPS and your compasses. Uh, you would have repeaters for your electronic chart displays, which is that. You can see kind of part of the pier in that photo and how long it is. Uh, this sector was where uh, our military would stand. Again, we had kind of paramilitary. We had Navy personnel on board. Uh, this was the, sort of the top secret communications area. So communications between a, a civilian ship and the, and the military has to be sort of top secret. Um, it has to be through certain, uh, certain avenues that aren't open to the public because a lot of the things you are saying, you know, rendezvous points and where to meet up, what the mission is of the vessel is, is you know, highly classified. Um, and, and giving those secrets away could... Um, impair the mission. Uh, there's a, an extra chart table here uh, that you know that you would, could do your chart corrections on. Obviously, all the safety equipment. That was one of the bridge wings. Uh, you could actually steer the ship from the bridge wings on both sides. You didn't actually need to be at the main console. We're coming around to the sort of the center of the bridge here, uh, and that was just kind of the brains of the operation. Oh, that's the candy bowl, it was empty at the time. We were very <laughs> upset about that. That always needed to be uh, full. Uh, and here you can see, uh, again, the redundancy with our systems. You'll see there's several radars, um, three centimeter and 10 centimeter radars. Uh, those were our throttles right there, um, and our bow thruster. And there was uh, the RPM indicators. There was also some of the ways to connect with the engine room through sound power phone and the way that we could communicate on deck to uh, the workforce. And we had an AIS. We had our uh, electronic display right in front. And then there's the wheel, the steering wheel. Nothing as that you see in sort of the, uh, the sailing ages. Um, this wheel is even, you know, it's very small. And you can even... Um, you can even put the ship in autopilot. You don't even have to use uh, that wheel in some cases. When you're in open sea uh, with no mission, there's no vessels around, you can put the ship in autopilot. It will steer, steer itself. Uh, different types of communication. Some are top secret, some are secret, some are different types of uh, ways to communicate with vessels that are a little bit more um, constricted. Uh, those were our maneuvering statistics for the vessel, which is uh, important for a, as an officer uh, to, to know how your ship would maneuver in certain cases. Um, should you have to uh, do a turn, you, you know, you obviously don't want to uh, overturn or underturn in certain scenarios and how it responds when it's at different uh, speeds moving forward. And these were all different ways to communicate in our lights and everything like that. Okay, so this is another uh, of my personal videos, and this is when uh, we were decommissioning the USS Enterprise, which was the first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. Uh, we were decommissioning it in 2012, and um, in part of decommissioning a aircraft carrier, step one is to uh, remove all the ammunition from that, from that vessel. So at the time, they moved up all their aircraft up to the main flight deck, so that they could, so that they could move up all their ammunition, and that was just one day of operations there. And, and what you can see are, are missiles and bombs, um, and probably some small arms in those uh, in the boxes. So that was just day one. It was about a six-day evolution to offload all the cargo that they needed. We did it alongside. We did it by the underway replenishment using the wires, and we also did it by vertical replenishment using helicopters but it took several days to do that. MSC absorbed that ammunition, and then we went to Earl, New Jersey to offload that ammunition. At the time here, I was um, second mate, and so I was in charge of that download, what we called uh, the decommissioning, uh, and making sure that the ammunition 
was one, safely transported over to our vessel. I had to do a lot of communications between the naval vessel uh, and the order in which the ammunition comes in because certain ammunition cannot be next to other ammunition because there is an effect where one could detonate the other. So there is more to just uh, adding on ammo uh, and just adding it into a hold and blocking and bracing it. There is much more um, science behind which things can go together. So those are my personal videos from that. Outside of the operations, the day-to-day -day operations of underway replenishment, we did get, uh, we were fortunate enough to travel all around the world. Uh, I got to travel through the Suez Canal. That's the pictures here. Um, again, a lot of my deployments were over in the Middle East. Uh, I would I'd usually leave from the East Coast and would it, it would take a couple of weeks to get over to the uh, Middle East. We'd make a couple stops in between. We'd hit up a couple of uh, Navy vessels and allied nations at the time. Um, but this is us going through the Suez Canal. We went as an air, as a Air Force strike group. Uh, so in front of us, in that upper left-hand picture, uh, was our aircraft carrier at the time. We had a couple of uh, destroyers. We had a couple of amphibs. And I know we had a submarine somewhere, but that was top secret, so I did not know where the submarine was. <laughs> Um, but at the time, when we go through the Suez Canal, when military installations go through the Suez Canal, there's extra manning, extra security. That's the picture in the middle where an Egyptian soldier, they were, Egyptian soldiers were manning the entire Suez Canal, the, you know, every so many yards um, and standing uh, and watching guard in case there was uh, some sort of catastrophe and, or an attack on uh, military ships. We also had a convoy of security that followed us the entire way through. So I've been everywhere um, except really India's sector. Um, I've uh, been to many, many countries while sailing in the seven years. I, I was rarely stateside, uh, so I'm proud to say that. It, it, sailing was everything that I imagined it as a student, where uh, it was the adventure that I was looking for. I definitely have stories to tell my grandchildren. Um, but here are some of the photos of places that I have been. Uh, the lower left-hand corner was Gibraltar, um, going into the Mediterranean Sea. You pass Gibraltar. Um, at the time I went, and you can see that there was, a, in, the, in the port, there was a um, oil tank on fire on the pier. So all my photos are kind of jaded with the, uh, the smoke in the back. Everybody was fine on that, but I thought that was very interesting. The, uh, the ship, the cruise ship at the pier had to get underway in an emergency. I know they had passengers that were out and about for the day, um, but they just had to leave them and get underway for the safety of those that were still on board. Uh, there was monkeys at the top of Gibraltar uh, that would go through your bags, and that was my Danish. Um, <laughs> they warned you not to um, have an open bag. I didn't really realize what that meant until my Danish was gone. Um, and, my, and the picture there in the middle is, is me as chief mate um, alongside an AFFF uh, foam hose, which is a firefighting aid. Um, that is when I was in, at my sort of peak leadership role as a chief mate on board um, a tanker. Uh, this was some pictures from the Middle East excursions. Uh, I was mainly in and out of the United Arab Emirates. Um, I also stopped in places like Bahrain, uh, Oman, and um, Djibouti, Africa, and, uh, and some of the surrounding countries in Africa. And so these were a couple of my take home. I did get some shore time here and there. Uh, the deployments we were on were usually around eight months long, so anytime you got a couple of free moments, you would, uh, you would go out and explore. So I got to go out into the, the desert a little bit on sort of a um, safari jeep ride and uh, got to see, you know, the largest uh, Dubai tower, you know, the largest tower in the world, the Burj Khalif. Another exciting thing that MSC offered for um, officers was the fact to connect with the air crew on board that were uh, Navy personnel. Um, again, as a chief mate, I was in charge of the tower. Can't really see it in these pictures, but I was in charge of um, basically their, uh, their flight status and making sure that uh, the operations were running smoothly via cargo and that their, um, they were in a certain cadence uh, because most of the time you'd work with two helicopters at once, you would wanna make sure that they were staggered enough that nobody was getting too close um, operationally. Uh, but what came with that was a connection with Navy pilots uh, that I'll uh, never uh, forget. Uh, they took me up flying with them multiple times. They, uh, Navy pilots have to stay in qualification and would often have to, at least once a week, um, do qualifications on our flight deck, um, do certain maneuvering to just continue to practice and make sure they, they don't lose the technique. 
So they would bring me up in their ships or up in their, uh, their um, helicopters and we get to do all the different type of maneuverings that they do for landings and for um, vertical replenishment. So that's a picture here of us. That's actually me uh, flying in the helicopter and then looking over the Sacagawea at the time. We were in the Middle East, so it was high humidity. You couldn't really see beyond. I mean, that was just humidity. That wasn't fog. Um, and we, we flew around. And then in the, the right-hand bottom corner is a typical uh, radar scene that you would see in the, for the traffic in the Middle East. Uh, and um, you could see that there was many, many contacts on there that we had to maneuver for. A lot of them were not equipped with bridge equipment. A lot of them were fishing vessels, which we called dows. And um, so we would have to maneuver around them. There was no other communication. So you got very good as a, as a watch officer to maintain, uh, to, to kind of navigate through all of that. So that's my story, MSC. I don't know if anyone uh, realized that sector of our uh, military in a way or our federal government, um, but it's a very fulfilling job. It, it was something that I felt at the end of the day, I mean, I was aiding our military and our service uh, men and women, helping them maintain station, helping them maintain their mission, keeping them safe. Um, you know, heaven forbid we ever missed transporting the, the monster energy drinks to the aircraft carrier, because that was their number one. Um, that had to go over first, and then second was the ice cream. Um, <laughs> but I felt like at the end of the day, I mean, these, the morale of these people were boosted because of the missions of what we did. Uh, but now, so I, I, I sailed for the seven years. I, I came back shoreside. Um, I now, my, my current hat is uh, Assistant Director of Career and Professional Services. I work actually directly with deck and engine students. I bring a lot of my personal experience forward to them and uh, talk about, you know, what it's like to be an officer on board, both deck and engine. I, I've been there. I've lived it. I, I tell them my sea stories. Um, I aid them in their professional careers, what they want to do, how to navigate that. I help them set up their required internship as part of their four-year curriculum. Um, during their junior winter term, they do have to go to sea outside of the academy and outside of the training ship that we own. They do have to go to sea on a, on a merchant vessel or an MSC vessel to really learn the trade. It's kind of their seagoing internship like you would see a shoreside internship. Um, and that way they, they really get to spread their wings. In a lot of cases, cadets will go either by themselves or maybe with another cadet, but you're not under the eyes and ears of your academic professors. You now get to kind of take what you learned in classroom and put it to practical effect. So I help students gain those billets and those experiences and, and what to take from those moving forward professionally. So I have come full circle in a way. And these are just a couple of the recent pictures of the students that commercially sailed this summer um, and uh, their experience and how happy they were. These, these industries range from uh, the left-hand side is the Great Lakes. Um, we've got a couple of research vessels in here, uh, just like uh, the NOAA Corps. You know, if you, if you hear about NOAA, um, they do a lot of research on wind and wave activity, so our students were involved with that, and um, underwater robotics. And then the middle pictures are students actually on, an, on this, the ship I was on, the, the Medgar Evers, um, back in 15 and 16. And uh, they're dressed up for their fire party um, and their, their firefighting exercise that they do to practice in case there was an actual fire. Okay, so um, that is my portion uh, right now and kind of my, my story in a nutshell. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Sam real quick. She's got some current pictures and, and kind of update you on everything that she's involved with. Again, she's a current senior at Mass Maritime and will be graduating in June 2023. So hi, everyone. My name is Sam, obviously. You've probably heard it a thousand times now. Um, I'm actually from Sykesville, Maryland, which you also probably have no idea where that's from. I live out in the mountains of Maryland, and yes, there's mountains in Maryland. A lot of people don't know that either. Um, but my parents were big fishermen when I grew up. Um, my mom, her, her family, they were big sport fishermen, and I grew up fishing with them, and I always thought, I want to be a marine biologist when I get older. I took a biology class in high school and absolutely hated it. Learned it was not what I wanted to do, and it was not my forte. So I started doing a little bit of research when I was in high school, and I knew I still wanted to work on the water, just not as much on the biology side. 
So I came across Mass Maritime. I ended up doing a tour my senior year of high school, um, and I did it with um, the female athletic director. Well, she's the assistant athletic director now. At the time, she was just an athletics recruiter. She was also similar to what um, now that we have a female RC and then a female XO. Um, she was one of the first ones that we've had at the academy, and she gave me an awesome tour. I felt like it was a really great place to be, and it was very appealing, and I ended up going here, and I don't regret it at all. This is one of the greatest decisions I made. So just a little bit, these two pictures. Um, so we're a fully regimented school, which means every cadet, we all wear uniforms. So my two roommates, which... I had freshman year that were both from Massachusetts. They both live within 30 minutes of the school. Um, they're in the bottom left corner. I learned a lot. I'm not from New England. I learned a lot about New England when I first got here. But you kind of face a lot of new challenges being a freshman at Mass Maritime. So when you first get to Mass Maritime, you go through two weeks of orientation. Um, and it's kind of like a mini boot camp, some people say. Before I got there, they told me it was going to be like summer camp. It was nothing <laughs> like summer camp. <laughs> I will say that. But um, I grew really close to the 60 people in my company. I knew all their names by the end of orientation. We went through a lot together. There's a lot of funny jokes that I still know with those people that I still go to school with. Something really unique about my class at Mass Maritime is that it used to be you would get switched after your freshman year what company you're in, but I've stayed with the same group of people since I was a freshman. Um, so we've all gotten to kind of see each other grow and become where we are now. Um, but I grew really close to these two other girls and we, we faced a lot of challenges freshman year. You know, you got somebody yelling at you that you didn't make your bed the right way or your wall, you didn't iron something the right way or your uniform doesn't look okay and it's totally new to you and you've never seen it before but it's kind of helped me, I'd say, definitely down the road. So freshman year, you have a very rigorous schedule every day. It's kind of, it's the same thing every day and you get used to it, but you're getting up really early. You have to do cleaning stations where you clean your whole company and then you have inspections in the morning and then you have all of your academics. My freshman year, I also did sports, so I went to practice after classes of four and then I'd have study hours and another, I'd also have cleaning stations again at night. So you're up from, 5 a.m. till 10 o'clock at night. And if you have a little bit more homework, you're still up past that time. But you grow, I grew so close to everyone around me. You push each other to become better and to get yourself on track. And I'm also a little bit of a unique case because I had COVID. And I'm not gonna lie, when I went home during COVID, I found myself getting up a little bit earlier. My mom was very happy about that because I didn't <laughs> sleep until noon. But I got up a little bit earlier and I had a better structure rather than just sitting around not doing anything. I'd be like, oh, I'll go do this and this and this. And I was a little bit more productive with my schedule. And I've seen that carry over to now. Um, when I was talking about I work at Highline Cruises, I'm able to balance that with my school life, which is really great. Um, I have kind of come through my journey at the Academy, come full circle. Um, so. I am the second supply rate, which isn't that big of a position, but I still have to mentor freshmen when they go on their first cruise. So basically on your freshman cruise, you do maintenance on the ship and you'll get put in, kind of separated and put into groups to go do something on the ship. So every day during maintenance, I'll be assigned a little group of freshmen and sophomores that are probably don't really know that much of what's going on around them and I have to give them tasks and kind of tell them what to do. Um, but my sophomore year, I was a hold captain, which means there's a birthing. So we have birthings, which are about 20 or 30 men for the women's birthings. And essentially it was me and one other girl. We were kind of in charge of 30 girls' livelihoods for the next, it was about a 40 day cruise that year because it was a short cruise because we went nowhere. So cruise nowhere during COVID. And that was a little bit rough too because you weren't getting off in ports. It was people butt heads. It was a little bit cabin feverish sometimes. But um, a lot of, I wanted, I always wanted an environment where some, if somebody doesn't feel comfortable or there's something going on or they can come up to me. There was a few girls that, you know, they'd have problems with 
people outside, people bothering them, and I always made sure it was a safe environment for them to come ask me questions or if they had any concerns. Um, so yeah, those are, that's a picture of my roommates, like I said. That's me in cell nav, I'm using a sexton. So um, cell nav is a big class at Mass Maritime. It's definitely a lot of a big work level. But I can say now I can take three things in the sky and find my position in a one mile radius. So that's, I think that's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, and then these are pictures from my commercial ship. I commercially shipped last winter with Kirby Offshore. Um, we were on a run from Mobile, Alabama to Houston. So they just went back and forth, back and forth. It was about 40, it was about 36 hour transit. Um, it was really cool. We carried, it was a chemical ATB, which means we were an articulated tug and barge unit. So we had, um, it was about 500 foot barge in front of a 100 foot tug. Um, we carried cumane, phenol, and acetone. Phenol is a very dangerous chemical. If it gets on your skin, it makes a little white mark and it can burn into your skin and it's very deadly, it's a little bit scary. Um, but I learned a lot. Um, that's me just with the radar up on the bridge. Um, that's just off the stern, a picture of me, and then that's what the um, barge looked like. Um, it was pretty cool. I also didn't know it got cold in Texas until I got there. <laughs> it, was the first, it snowed in Texas. I, I thought I was gonna go to Texas and I never see snow, I saw snow. And then these are just some other pictures. Um, the three ones on the bottom are for sea term. So um, the bottom two are actually from my freshman sea term. Uh, I'm still friends with the two girls to the left. Um, we're all deckies. We're pretty good friends to this day. We've been friends since freshman year. Um, and then those are my, on the left, over to the other side, the two girls in just regular clothes. Those are my freshman year roommates. So since I'm out of state, they came all the way to see the ship leave um, when I left for my first sea term. And then above that, it's a group of us at, um, it was a cruise of nowhere my sophomore year. We just decided to all take a picture together. That's uh, mainly all the sophomore girls that were on that cruise. Again, we're all pretty close at this point because we've been in school for so long together and we lived inches away from each other for two months. And then to the left, that's from my summer job. I worked at Highline Cruises on the um, Cape. I worked on the Nantucket boats. I still work there to this day. So it's a lot of fun. It's kind of just a side job, but I've learned a lot there too. Um, more just about like um, like passenger vessels and that type of stuff. There's definitely different requirements. I think that's just about it. Um, so once I get out of Mass Maritime, I definitely want to use my license and ship out. I'm thinking of going into MSC, which is similar to what Lieutenant Kaz did, <laughs> or going into the Union, such as AMO, um, and getting to really see the world and go deep sea for a few years, and then kind of see where that takes me. I'm not set in any place of exactly what I want to do yet, but that's definitely the realm I want to go down. And this is the last slide. It just uh, we've come a far way. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Um, and uh, I can say that you know working at Mass Maritime, being an alum from there, Sam, I'm sure can reiterate. Um, we are definitely very fulfilled by the opportunity that are granted to women at sea at this point and what we've experienced and what we can bring forward to future generations. Mass Maritime has a very uh, beyond close alumni uh, network uh, where we support each other in anything we do. You can reach out to any alumni by even a phone call uh, and we're there to support each other. I don't know many colleges that could say the same. You probably didn't even know most of the people in your class. Uh, in, on our campus, you know every, every student there um, and stay connected through uh, all the years to come. So we're proud to be MMA alum. We're proud to be uh, the, the sort of the now seafarers of this uh, industry and this generation. Thanks so much for your time.
Okay. Let me, let's open it up to uh, questions and answers. And um, as we have previously discussed, uh, there's probably no reason for me to get in the middle of this. Uh, I think these ladies are quite competent to handle questions and answers. Uh, what we'd like to do is uh, open it up to questions here in this room. Uh, and then when we run out of questions from you, uh, we will turn the control over to Liz, who will uh, post the questions or voice the questions that are coming in through Zoom's Q&A. I'm just going to repeat the question real quick, Sam. So the question was for our Zoom uh, users. Uh, the question for Sam is, uh, what do her ribbons mean on her uniform? Yes. Yeah. All right. They're not. They're not that special. Um, so this one. <laughs> this one's for orientation, graduation, um, and then the other ribbon. This is only to cadets that went to Mass Maritime during the pandemic, um, because we did go through. A, a lot, especially in the classroom, a lot of different changes. Um, the next one's the C term. Um, the other one's the Mass State License for having an OSHA, um, for getting an OSHA credential or license. Um, the next one's Girl Scouts. When I was a kid, I was in Girl Scouts. Um, the other one's varsity sports. Uh, my freshman year, I did crew and track. The other one's SGA. I worked at the SGA lounge my sophomore year. Um, good conduct ribbon, that's for not getting tapped for a whole year. <laughs> not getting in trouble if you don't know what a tap sheet is. And then the other one is just for being a senior officer at school. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, so the question is um, transporting personnel more by air uh, than by sea. And yes, uh, that's the case now. Uh, a lot of troops are, are sent in via aircraft uh, than they used to be in, in MSC's history where it was by, um, by vessel. So yes, that's like sort of the modern, uh, modern take on that. Right. Yes. We, um, to sort of go off of that, there is still uh, methods in which we can transport personnel via underway replenishment. So you saw how we move those cargo pallets. We can actually do it with personnel. Um, I was a part of that one time uh, where the vessel, neither vessel that was doing an underway replenishment had a helicopter that we could either transport person um, to the other vessel or t uh, to shore. So we actually have a, a sort of a man basket, like it's a, it's a basket that's got a, like a five point harness. Um, it's not for the weary. Uh, you were sent across two moving vessels. The open ocean is below you. Um, but we, I have had to transport people that way uh, in, in times where we just didn't have the equipment available. Yes. That would be something to write about, that's for sure. I don't think you forget that memory. Yes. Uh, I had some dealings with the uh, Naval Academy before I came up here and spent a lot of time tracking it. All of the service academies had a very hard time um, locking the women into their ranks when they were finally angry. Uh, certainly were blacks as well, but women tended to in some ways perhaps get uh, the worst of the Naval Academy, in my understanding, was the worst of the worst of mm -hmm. uh, many of the other service academies. Could you address a little bit what it was like in the, uh, the Maritime Academies, not just in the name, but the other ones, uh, since you were not directly military, but it was still a painful transition for a country at that time? Uh, what was it like? 
Well. Right. Okay. So the question is um, recruiting women uh, through the other uh, state maritime academies or the um, the military academies. Uh, yes, you're right. Uh, the Naval Academy does have one, uh, sort of a harder time recruiting women. I think it's just the the nature of the obligation of uh, the military itself, right, and s sort of the specialized missions. Us at the State Maritime Academies and working for MSC, it's a different story. It's a different spin. Um, there is no military obligation at the end of this. You're a merchant officer. You can be that as long as you want. You don't have to be that at all upon graduation. So I think that appeals to some women that there is no... Um, uh, dedicated time you have to give and of course we're not as much boots on the ground at the, sort of the forefront of um, the military mission you know we support the military but we're a little bit more the background people so I, I definitely uh, while I was tr transporting ammunition to the aircraft carrier my mind always thought you know where where are these missiles going you know these are people on board um, that are sort of fighting at the war lines um, we didn't quite have that exposure, uh, so I do think yes. Uh, the other, the other academies, and I can't really speak on so much the military academies and their uh, enrollment for female numbers or diversity. Uh, I would say we're the highest one of the state maritime academies, uh, which is uh, nice to brag about. Um, and we, uh, but I think a lot of us are kind of in a similar place where it's around sort of the 10% to 14% enrollment of, of females. And again, I think uh, part of it is because uh, one, it's, it is a STEM role. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you, you earn a Bachelor of Science degree. So right there is kind of already, some women don't necessarily get into that field. Then you add on a layer of the fact that, you know, it's an at sea uh, lifestyle. You know, you kind of give up your, personal uh, holidays and your fan, seeing your family every day, so that's not for the faint at heart. Um, so it's just the mission of what we do too, but that's changing a little bit in uh, the future generations and, and, and future technology. Ships now have the availability for you to have shorter stints on board. Um, MSC's uh, time on board was usually four months on as an officer, two months off, but uh, oftentimes because of where you were located, you weren't able to get off in your four months. I was oftentimes getting off maybe around my eight month mark, or maybe I did a whole year at sea. Um, I was on board one vessel for three and a half years. Um, so it nowadays modern technology and modern ships uh, allow crew changeovers to be every couple of weeks possibly, or maybe every month. And so there is a little bit more, um, there's a little bit more advocacy and more opportunities for both men and women to still have a uh, work-life balance in a pretty tough industry. And so that's appealing to more and more of this generation. So we see an influx of, of all different diverse backgrounds um, that find the industry more appealing. And so our numbers go up, which is great. Okay, so let's go to our viewers on Zoom. There, we have a couple of questions. Uh, the first comment is from a viewer is, this was really cool, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the second question is from Joe, and he wants to know if there are any international students. There are international students. Um, we have a close relationship to Panama Maritime. Uh, we, we have a, so we have a close uh, connection with Panama Maritime students, so we do have Panamanian uh, current enrolled students that come up to our academy. Um, we also have had partnerships with um, Shanghai and Denmark, where we've had international students come over uh, from abroad where they'll study here for a semester, and then we'll send one of our students over there for a semester. Uh, that stopped during the COVID uh, couple of years, just, you know, obviously because of safety, but we're going to be onboarding that again uh, this, this next year. So that was great. And then as far as um, sort of international students now, a, a snapshot of the freshman class, I know we have a, a couple from Greece, uh, we have a couple from Morocco, uh, we have a couple from um, um, uh, I think we have somebody from uh, Vietnam. So we have kind of a sprinkling of sort of international students that hear about our reputation and what we have to offer on the back end. So we're proud to say, yeah, we have a pretty good diversity uh, of our undergrad, undergrads. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from another viewer. And it says, what piece of advice would you give to women who want to have a career in the maritime industry? Okay, so uh, the, uh, my advice, um, I would definitely 
enroll in one of the maritime academies. I mean, mass maritime, I'm biased, but um, any of the maritime, they're state, uh, seven state maritime academies. Uh, they're a, a great conduit for preparing you for life at sea. So Sam talked a little bit about the regiment and what, you know, and wearing the uniform and uh, having to participate early in the morning. Uh, these are all translatable traits in leadership that you have to do as a deck officer. Um, and so, to start it as sort of uh, a four-year tenure at the academy and start to learn this, it's ingrained in you, you can bring it forward and you can, uh, as a deck officer in charge of the safety of not only the vessel but the safety of the crew on board, you're much more prepared to be that leader. You're more attentive to detail. You are um, your better time manager. You are somebody that takes safety seriously because that's ingrained in everything we do at the regiment. So my advice is to enroll at an, at an academy, get involved, get involved with um, alumni, female alumni, or current students. We're all there to support. We all have avenues of certain different connections with companies and certain career paths that can take you to where you want to go and beyond. Um, but rely on the people that have gone through the industry or have been a part of it because I think those are your greatest allies and um, they'll do anything for you to help your aid in your success. Thank you. All right, I know we're running up against the clock here, so we'll take one more Zoom question. Um, and that has to do with going to sea. Once you graduate, is it, do most women go to sea or can you take a, a job landside? Most women uh, and men go to sea upon graduation. Uh, when you get that United States Coast Guard license, it, you know, you really want to scratch that itch right away. Um, you know, you're fresh off of a four-year curriculum. You're fresh off of taking a, a five-day, very difficult uh, Coast Guard test uh, to be able to be licensed to do so. So yes, most go to sea, but you do not have to. Uh, a lot of our skills are translatable in uh, program or project management. Uh, again, that's kind of rooted at the regiment and what we've been involved in as leaders, as students. Um, and then we also have a lot of like our marine engineers who run the sort of the engine department of a ship have translatable skills in any power plant. Um, they can work for defense contractors. They can work for shipyards. There's, so yes, there's so many opportunities for like shoreside opportunities for licensed track deck and engine officers. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Mm -hmm. thank you. We have a little, we have a little thank you present for each of you for presenting to us tonight. Thank you. Wear our hats in good health. <laughs> thank you all for joining us tonight. This program has been recorded. In a few days, will be available on our website, chattermarconi.org, along with Tuesday evening's program featuring Barbara Semple from the Atwood Museum. Details about the center, our Marconi RCA Wireless Museum, and our speaker series programs are available on our website. Thank you again for joining us tonight, and good night. Thank you.